The Orioles won a wild one on Thursday on opening day to start the season 1-0. But the weekend did not end with any more victories. And frankly, it came with one of the most heartbreaking losses we've ever seen from the Orioles. I'll break down the O's season opening series loss to the Red Sox coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, April 3rd, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb, and coming up on today's episode, we will be recapping the Orioles' first series of the year, and specifically the Saturday and Sunday games in Boston. Because the season started off well. The Orioles with a 10-9 win on opening day on Thursday. Make sure to go back and check out Thursday's episode for a recap of that one. And it looked like on Saturday they were going to get to 2-0. And then the Orioles collapsed and lost Saturday and lost Sunday again to drop the series. I'll recap both Orioles' losses to the Red Sox and get you some general thoughts and some things you need to know from the Orioles' first series of 2023. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Ultimate Baseball GM. Have you ever dreamed of becoming an MLB GM and managing your baseball franchise? Then this game is definitely for you. To download the game, just visit ultimatebaseballgm.com or look it up on the app stores. Our listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using promo code Locked On in the game. So the Orioles after starting hot, kind of fizzled in their first series of the year. It was a 10-9 victory on opening day on Thursday, the off day Friday, but back-to-back -back losses, losing 9-8 Saturday and 9-5 on Sunday in Boston against the Red Sox. And the Orioles dropped their first series of the year and start the 2023 season at 1-2. and two. And let's start today by recapping the Saturday game. I'll get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 9-8 walk-off loss in Boston on Saturday. And the first thing you need to know, let's just get it out of the way. After seeing what happened, and I'm sure you've all seen what happened at this point in the ninth inning of that game, I was not feeling good after that one. I don't think many of you were. A lot of the hurt had to do with how the game was lost. A lot of the hurt, I think, had to do with it being the first loss of a season that has expectations. This 2023 season is the first Orioles won with legitimate expectations in six years, since 2017, when they were coming off their last playoff appearance in 2016. And you get a nice win on opening day, you're feeling good, and you experience your first loss. But it's not just a loss, it's that. And the O's can probably lose maybe 75 games this year and still get into the postseason. That's the nature of the baseball season. You lose a lot of games, you can still do well. But to have that loss be your first loss, it was tough to find a feeling that was worse than that. I thought back to probably two games last year. One was the second half of the back-to-back -back losses in Minnesota via walk-off when Jorge Lopez blew back-to-back -back saves. And the other one would be that Saturday night game in September at home against the Astros, the crazy back-and-forth game where the Orioles lost it in the ninth inning. But this one hurt. If you did miss it, the Orioles open up a 7-1 to one lead in this game. Red Sox just gnawed away, ticked away. 8-7 game heading into the bottom of the ninth. Felix Bautista retires the first two batters. With two outs, gets Masataka Yoshida to pop one up to left field. Ryan McKenna comes in, settles under it. Ball game over. Except no, it's not. Ball falls out of his glove. Throws it in. Yoshida safe at first. And two pitches later, Adam Duvall just over the monster for a two-run walk-off homer to give the Red Sox the win. You can't have much of a blunder more than this with Ryan McKenna out there. And I think a lot of the reaction we saw was, well, why is McKenna out there in the first place? And why is Kyle Stowers not playing? I mean, Stowers did not start any of the three games this weekend. And why is McKenna out there if you have these other guys? And why is he on the team if you have Colton Kowser and others in AAA? I will say, 
I agreed with him being on the team, and I still agree with him on the team. I think you can make a case that maybe Franchi Cordero should have made the team over Ryan McKenna, but he still serves a purpose as, in theory, that fifth outfielder who's a defensive replacement and pinch runs and can hit lefties a little bit. And that's why McKenna was in the lineup Saturday. Chris Sale, lefty on the mound, McKenna hitting out of the nine hole and playing left field. And here's kind of the news flash: Even if McKenna wasn't in the starting lineup Saturday, he would have been out there in that spot. He either would have been replacing Santander or Vavra or Frazier or even Stowers, whoever was the non-Austin Hayes outfielder in the corner defensively. In a one-run game in the ninth inning, McKenna would have been out there as a defensive replacement in the ninth. Just so happens that he started the game, so he played all nine innings. So that's not a decision of like, would he not be out there? If he's going to be on the roster, he's going to be out there in that spot. Does it hurt that your defensive replacement guy is the guy who drops that ball? Yes. Does it also hurt that, yeah, Felix Bautista could have gotten the next guy out or at least still gotten out of the inning instead of giving up a two-run homer two pitches later? Yeah, he could have done that. Felix was, once again, he was better than he was on Thursday when he gave up two runs, but he was still not sharp and just did not have the splitter command on Saturday either. And we'll talk about a lot more that happened to the O's. I mean, they had a 7-1 to lead in this game. It didn't need to be a one-run game in the ninth. And they played some bad defense again other than the McKenna play. But that McKenna play was just, I mean, get under the ball. Make the catch. You got to make the catch. And that one's going to hurt for a while. And it hurts more because it's the first loss of the year. I get it. In perspective, that play happens in June. It's very different. But yeah, that was bad. Second thing you need to know from that one on the positive side is that Austin Hayes was the offensive star on Saturday after Adley Rutschman had a five-hit game on opening day. Austin Hayes came up with five hits in game two of the season, and he was swinging it well. And it was interesting for Hayes because Hayes was the only Orioles batter who did not reach base on opening day. He went 0 for 5, but game two, all of a sudden, Hayes out there with a 5 for 5 with two doubles and a home run. Only two hard-hit balls in the day, but hey, if you're still reaching five times, you're still reaching five times. He had a home run in this game as well off of Chris Sale. Just swung the bat incredibly well in this one and got himself five hits. And and good for Austin Hayes, who again, you know, his roster spot could be wavering at some point this year if he does not perform well, but big to start his season like that. And I mentioned Chris Sale. The third thing you need to know from Saturday's loss is that the Orioles just destroyed, just destroyed Chris Sale. In this game, Sale allowed seven runs on seven hits over three innings. Now, he did strike out six, and the stuff looked pretty good, but he walked two, and the Orioles hit three homers against him. Ryan Mountcastle hit his first home run of the season. It was a two-run shot in the first inning, just demolished a baseball to put the Orioles on the board. And Cedric Mullins also hit a homer off of Sale, and Mullins hit one at 104. The Mountcastle home run was at 107. And the Mullins home run was big because it came off a lefty in sale and Mullins was hitting down in the eighth spot in the lineup. He was still getting the start in center field, but was hitting eighth because it was a lefty Mullins who struggled badly against left-handers last season, but Mullins got a single later in the game against sale, two hits against a lefty. And this one also had a hit against a lefty on Sunday, which we'll talk about, but that was big, big, big for the Orioles. And they just kept coming at him and the Mullins three run homer really felt like this game was going to get put away. That, came in the third inning, and all of a sudden, I mean, the game was 7-1 to one at the top of the third, and you're feeling good, but Sale got out of there, and, and credit to the Red Sox bullpen, who only gave up one more run the rest of the way, but O's really did jump on him early. Fourth thing you need to know for the Orioles, Dean Kramer was bad in his first start of 2023, and shout out to Kramer, who was amazing last year, who got the number two spot in the rotation, who's going to start the home opener on Thursday, but he was bad, and it was a concerning amount of bad in this game. Now, it wasn't super terrible in the first two innings. He had a a quick and easy first inning. He gives up a leadoff triple in the second, but on a ball that maybe could have been caught. And then after a wild pitch scores the run, he strikes out the side. So he gets to the third. His team just put up a four spot at the top of the third. They're leading seven to one. And Kramer just gets pummeled in that third inning. And I mean pummeled in that third inning. Like it was concerning that third inning for Kramer, he comes out there with the seven to one lead. He walks Enrique Hernandez. Then he gives up a home run to Verdugo, 106 off the bat, 419 feet. Ball was crushed. Then he gives up a single to Rafael Devers. 
Then he gives up a double to Justin Turner. And Kramer was actually lucky because the single from Devers was 102 off the bat. It should have been a double, but Devers overslid the base and was tagged out at second. So that was one of Kramer's outs. Then you get a Turner double off the monster. Then Yoshida flies out deep, 97 off the bat, 386 feet. Lucky it's a fly out. Then Duvall mashes a two-run homer, 107 off the bat over the monster. All of a sudden, it's a 7-5 game. And then Tristan Cassis flies out, but still hit it 350 feet and 94 miles per hour off the bat. Kramer got mashed in that third inning. He completed the inning, but Brandon Hyde smartly went to the bullpen after that because Kramer just did not have it. And baseball reference, they put together a game score for every stat. It's basically an all-encompassing stat trying to compare starts because it's hard to compare a start where you give up, you know, six runs over three innings versus a start where you give up, I don't know, eight runs over five innings, or it, it tries to compare different starts. And you're trying to get, you know, near a hundred with your game score. Well, Dean Kramer's game score was 29 in this start. There was only one start he made in the entirety of the 2022 season that had a lower game score than this one. That was July 30th in Cincinnati last year when Kramer allowed six runs on 10 hits over four and a third innings with two strikeouts and three walks. His start in this game, although the game score was a little better, three innings, five runs, six hits, three Ks, a walk, and two homers. I would argue on paper, this start may have been worse than that one in Cincinnati last year, which means there's a strong argument that Kramer's 2023 debut was worse than any outing he had in 2022. I mean, that third inning was the worst he's looked since that disaster 2021 season. It's early. It was three innings. It was 56 pitches. He can certainly turn it around. I mean, in terms of the stuff, like the velocity was up for Dean Kramer, which is always a good sign. I mean, the four-seamer was sitting 95 to 97. That was way up from last year. Cutter Velo was up to 92. That was way up. All his velocities were up, which was a good sign. He was throwing his sweeper. He was mixing his pitches but he was just in the middle of the plate and he was getting crushed. So hopefully he fixes that for Thursday. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles crushing loss on Saturday is that they did continue to run the base as well. And the Orioles set a major league record as they stole five more bases on Saturday without being caught. Mateo got two more and then Mullins, McKenna and Hayes each got one. The Orioles became the first team in major league history to go 10 for 10 in stolen bases in their first two games of a major league season. They are certainly taking advantage of the new rules in baseball this year. Everybody's running. It's been Mateo Mullins, McKenna Hayes, and Frazier so far, and it could be more guys as the Orioles move on. But despite some positives from that game, it's it's hard to get over that loss. And a win, hopefully today, this week at some point, will help me get over it a little bit. But when you drop a can of corn fly ball and the very next batter with two outs in the ninth, hits a two-run walk-off homer against one of your rivals in Fenway Park against Boston, it is hard to get over a loss like that. But the O's had a chance to do it on Sunday. If they would have come back out there, won a game, they could have kind of forgotten the Saturday loss and started the year with a series victory. But once again, they gave up nine more runs and they lost again. Coming up next, I'll recap the Sunday loss that gave the series to the Red Sox. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Ultimate Baseball GM. Ultimate Baseball GM, it's really the coolest game I've played in a while. I thought I might have a chance to be a great Major League GM, but it turns out it is not that easy. And if you've had that same thought, go download Pro Baseball GM immediately. The game allows you to manage every aspect of a franchise. You're hiring coaches and staff. You're managing the finances. You're scouting and drafting players, going through difficult personalities, managing injuries, You're going through free agency, the trade deadline, everything a GM does, you do it on Pro Baseball GM. And the big thing as well is it's a tough game. Like they don't just make it easy. It is a tough, tough game. It's a little more involved than fantasy baseball, but it will challenge you. And Locked On Orioles listeners get a 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code Locked On in the game store. So make sure to check it out. To download the game, just visit probaseballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up on the app stores. That's probaseballgm.com. Ultimate Baseball GM. Start your dynasty today. So the Orioles had... 
kind of an all-timer of losses on Saturday with the drop fly ball and the walk-off homer. But because they won on opening day, they had a chance to come back on Sunday and still win a series and wipe away all the bad feelings of Saturday. Well, the Orioles did not do that. They fell 9-5 to in Sunday's series finale, and they lose 2-3 of three in Boston to open up the 2023 season. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 9-5 to loss to the Red Sox on Sunday. And the first thing you need to know is that Paul Irvin, while he wasn't good in this game, he wasn't as bad as his line score showed because pretty much he was dinked and dunked to death in this game. Irvin, in his Orioles debut, goes four-plus innings, allowing six runs on eight hits. He struck out four and walked two and allowed one home run through 88 pitches in the game. Now, four innings put it in last year would have been one of his shortest starts. I mean, he was consistently going six plus innings for the athletics last year, but the luck was just not on his side. Although Irvin allowed eight hits, only four balls off the bat of Red Sox hitters against Cole Irvin were hard hit balls in this game. It was infield singles. It was bloop singles that were bringing in runs. Quite frankly, it had to be a frustrating game out there. For Cole Irvin. Now, he still didn't have his absolute best stuff, and his command was not all there. And he did throw a lot of four seam fastballs, which he was, you know, basically sitting 91, 92 with the pitch. But, you know, he's not a guy who misses bats. He certainly didn't miss bats on Sunday, only four whiffs on 41 swings. But I thought his changeup played well. I thought he mixed his stuff, the four seamer changeup, curveball, and sinker pretty well on the day. He just got very, very unlucky. And I'm not saying he pitched well, because if you pitch well and get unlucky, you generally throw five or so innings, give up three runs, thought you could have been better. Six runs over four plus innings is not good. Not good. But a lot of those hits, again, eight hits, only four hard hit balls. I mean, it's not like the Red Sox squared him up in this game. So I'm not too worried about Cole Irvin. I'm worried about the pitching staff as a whole. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But generally, I am not super worried about what Irvin did in this game. I mean, uh, the hardest hit ball he gave up in this one. Devers hit one 109.9 off the bat. But the second hardest hit ball was a fly out at 101. And there were a couple more hits. I mean, even the, the home run he gave up to Enrique Hernandez wasn't even hit 100 miles per hour off the bat. Yeah, it's he was unlucky. He'll be helped by the big wall at Camden Yards. Second thing you need to know from this one is that Cedric Mullins at the plate continued his hot streak for the Orioles. Mullins in the loss on Sunday, back in the leadoff spot, goes two for five with a home run and three RBIs. Mullins had three hard hit balls on the day, and he just continues to swing it well, getting more hits against lefties, had two on Saturday, got another one on Sunday. I just felt like he is seeing it a little better than he saw it at times last season. It's a very small sample size. It's just three games, but the home run Mullins hit was 104 off the bat, 380 feet, tied the game in the fifth inning with a solo shot. Also had a fly out, which he hit pretty well earlier in the game, had a couple of fly balls that were actually hit pretty well, smoked a single up the middle as well for a couple RBIs in this game in the seventh inning as the Orioles tried to make their comeback. I just like the way he's swinging it right now, especially against left-handers. It bodes well for Mullins moving forward this season. Third thing you need to know from this one is that Adam Frazier had his kind of first showing out party for the Orioles, hitting in the eight hole today and playing second base. He goes three for four with a double, a home run, and two RBIs and two hard hit balls. Adam Frazier, who smoked a two-run homer in the fifth inning to get the Orioles on the board, hitting that one off of Tanner Houck to make it a three to two game. We didn't see Frazier really square up many balls in 2022 with the Mariners, but Frazier goes 104 off the bat, 396 feet into right field for a two run homer. And again, he ended up a triple shy of the cycle in this game. And Frazier, he's going to be a slap hitter. He's going to play solid defense at second base. But what he did do is show off a little power and Frazier only hit three home runs with the Mariners last season. And his first home run last year didn't come until May 5th. So to hit one on April 2nd this year, pretty good sign for Adam Frazier and the Orioles. Fourth thing you need to know from this one is that Taryn Vavra and Kyle Stowers each made their season debuts on Sunday. Neither of them got into the games on Thursday or Saturday, but Vavra did get the start 
in the Orioles lineup on Sunday, started in left field, hitting sixth in the lineup, did single back up the middle in his first at bat, but ended up one for four with a single and a strikeout in the game and did play left field the entire time. Uh, did have a little bit of trouble out there in left field, I will say. Misplayed a ball off the wall earlier in the game. And then later, a miscommunication with Gunnar Henderson allowed a pop-up to drop in. So it wasn't great out there for Vavra. And then Kyle Stowers actually did not start this game either. He was used as a pinch hitter in the ninth inning for Ramon Arias and ended up striking out on three pitches in his only plate appearance so far. We still have not seen Stowers in the starting lineup. I'm sure we'll see it in Texas this week, but not a huge impact from those two really this weekend. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles nine to five loss on Sunday is that the bullpen had its struggles again. Now, Brian Baker was the first guy out of the bullpen after Cole Irvin allowed the first two batters to reach in the fifth inning and was pulled without recording and out in that frame. Baker did allow all of the inherited runners to score in that inning. However, Baker's final line for a reliever, looked pretty good. He goes two scoreless innings, one hit, two strikeouts, and no walks and no hard hit balls. He didn't really let Boston square him up a little bit. Again, he was dinked and dunked just like Irvin was, but he still couldn't get out of that inning. He did pitch a cleaner sixth inning, which was nice to see. So I'd say overall positive for Baker, although he couldn't really shut the door. But then Keegan Aiken allowed a few base runners. He was charged with two runs, recording only one out. Mike Bauman got the final five outs, did give up a run, but he walked two batters and just didn't look amazing out there throwing 43 pitches. So the bullpen, once again, as it happened all weekend, just didn't show up for the O's. And I mean, when you give up nine runs in each of the three games, you're not going to win a lot of them. And that's what we'll discuss to finish off the pod because the Orioles, frankly, kind of lucky to get out of Boston with the one win they got because the pitching and the defense, they were not good. And we'll break down how bad it was coming up in a bit to finish off the pod. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Built Bar. The Built March Madness bracket is here. We know you have a favorite bar or puff, and now's your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. You know I'll be voting for the Peanut Butter Brownie Bar because it is the best one out there. But when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you will be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built. And not only that, but one Locked On fan won a 12-month subscription to Built to have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. And if you haven't tried a Built bar yet, you got to try it. It is literally the best tasting protein bar ever. Finally, a protein bar that tastes good, covered in chocolate, and tastes like a candy bar. And still the health benefits of a protein bar as well. 17 grams of protein, not much sugar either. So run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March, so hop in and support your pick. So after kind of an ugly series to start the season for the Orioles, get the opening day win but lose the next two in Boston, start the year one and two with a series loss to the Red Sox, the first thing you have to point to is the Orioles pitching and the Orioles defense. Because listen, the offense did all it could in this series to win. I mean, if you tell me that the O's are going to score 23 runs in a three-game series, I'm taking that all day. If you tell me the O's scored 10 runs, eight runs, and five runs, I'm saying at the very least they won two out of three, and they probably swept that series. But that is not what happened. The Orioles lost the series because, first of all, the pitching was not good. Boston scores nine runs in all three games, and the Red Sox became only the third team in Major League history to score at least nine runs in each of their first three games of a season. Now, the Orioles last allowed nine plus runs in three straight games at the end of the 2021 season. Shout out to Nathan Ruiz of the Baltimore Sun for tweeting that out. That's not super surprising, but the last time they did it for the first three games of a season, you got to go back to 1978. So it's been a while. Oriole pitching this weekend, just not good. An 8.42 ERA for the Oriole staff in 25 and two thirds innings. They allowed 24 earned runs. 36 hits. Now, 24 strikeouts to nine walks is not bad in that stretch, but 36 hits in about 26 innings. Got to be a little better than that. And the Orioles starters, well, they were even worse. I mean, I know the bullpen looked shaky, but the bullpen was better than the starters. The Orioles' three starters this weekend, Kyle Gibson, Dean Kramer, and Cole Irvin, combined to throw just 12 innings. 
You cannot have three starters, your top three in your rotation, start the year combining for 12 innings. That already puts your bullpen behind the eight ball. I would not be surprised if the Orioles make a roster move before Monday's game, just because they used so many pitchers already over the weekend because the starters couldn't get deep into games. 12 innings, 15 runs on 20 hits allowed. That's an 11.25 starter ERA. Now, they did strike out 10 and only walked four in those 12 innings. So again, the strikeout to walk numbers are good, which does tell you that they're still throwing strikes. The walks were not an issue. And the ERA and the runs will come down when you're striking out guys and not walking guys. That is the good thing here. That's the positive. But the negative is that is way too many hits they are giving up right now. And maybe the luck we saw at times last year is running out a little bit, but it's concerning. And I mean, you look at all the pitchers in general. I mean, CNL Perez had a solid weekend. Danny Colomb had a nice Orioles debut. He threw a, a scoreless inning and, and Logan Gillespie had two scoreless appearances. But other than that, everybody else, I feel like struggled at times this weekend. And you, you leave the weekend saying, who do we trust in the bullpen right now? Because listen, Felix Bautista got two save chances and he should have been two for two. I mean, he didn't get help from his defense in either one, but he was still shaky. You know, he had no splitter command in either appearance, was able to sneak his way out of the opening day game. And again, listen, he should have had a one, two, three inning. We all know that on Saturday. Ryan McKenna, you have to catch that ball. I'm sorry. I just don't understand how he didn't catch it. Now, Felix Bautista didn't have to allow a two-run homer to Adam Duvall, the next batter. But Bautista pitched well enough, as we saw, to get another save. But that splitter wasn't anywhere near the zone, and he had to rely on his fastball a lot. It's a little concerning. But other than that, I mean, who are you trusting in the pen right now? I mean, I would say I still trust Felix Bautista, and I trust CNL Perez with how he looked this weekend. But I think my number three option is Logan Gillespie right now. I mean, he's looked the best over anybody else. Baker's been shaky. Bauman's been shaky. Aiken's been shaky. It hasn't been a good look for the Orioles' bullpen, and they are really missing Dylan Tate and Michael Givens right now, who are both on the injured list. And Tate has been Brandon Hyde's most, maybe not most successful reliever, but definitely the most reliable reliever over the last two years. And Michael Givens was a veteran adult in the room to come in and help give a veteran presence to this bullpen. And without both of those guys, you have a lot of young, inexperienced guys. Once again, I don't know who the O's go to. If tonight in Texas, the Orioles are leading six to four, heading into the bottom of the eighth. I have no idea who the ball's going to go to. I mean, they're probably going to try to get it to CNL Perez and then Felix Bautista. But what if Perez has already pitched earlier in the game because there were lefties up? I guess you go to Logan Gillespie at this point. And he was probably the last guy. I think he was the 26th man on this roster. So that's a little concerning. Now, the defense, just as bad, if not worse, than the pitching. Yeah, there wasn't too many true errors in the three-game series, but the outfield was a disaster. You had Hayes, Santander, Mullins, misjudging baseballs all over the place. Of course, there's the Ryan McKenna play. And in the infield, you have Henderson and, and Vavra, you know, misjudging a pop-up. You have Ramona Rios making a throwing error. You had Jorge Mateo making the bad throwing error in the ninth inning on Thursday. Now you got Mateo, you know, he he did not play on Sunday after getting a cut on his hand, stealing a bag on Saturday. I mean, Brandon Hyde made it seem like he'd probably be back in the lineup Monday, but we don't know. That was a big part of this Orioles team last year. Their defense kept them where they were to have a winning season, and their bullpen kept them where they were. And both things were kind of a disaster in the first weekend of the year. Small sample size, only three games, I get it. But it's just a, a little cause for concern to start the year. And I would say last cause for concern... I mean, what are you supposed to do with Adam Duvall at this point? We have found the new Orioles killer. Duvall signs a deal with the Red Sox to play center field. People are like, what's going on? Well, Adam Duvall, it wasn't just the walk-off homer he hit on Saturday. He was 8 for 14 with two homers, three doubles, and a triple, and eight RBIs against the Orioles this weekend. He is Randall Grichik. He is Mookie Betts. He is Aaron Judge. Let's just, uh, let's just not pitch to Adam Duvall for a little while. But I'll end it with a positive note. Gunnar Henderson did not have a hit this weekend. But you know what? He walked six times. He reached base six times in three games. I'm not worried. His batter's eye has been elite. The Orioles walked a lot this weekend. That is certainly a good thing. But the offense isn't the problem. It's the pitching and the defense. And hopefully, hopefully, 
They'll get it straightened out as they travel to Texas this week. That is where the Orioles go next. A three-game series with the Texas Rangers starts tonight. The Orioles will send Kyle Bradish to the mound. My breakout pick for 2023. I think he's going to have a big season. He faces off with the right-hander John Gray. It's an 8.05 start here on a Monday to open up a three-game series between the Orioles and and the Rangers. And I'll be back here on the podcast tomorrow, recapping all the action from Monday night's game. Hope the O's get back to 500 with a win over a Texas team that I got to say, not a good matchup right now for the Orioles as the Rangers in their first two games of the season pummeled the Phillies, scored 11 and then 16 runs in those first two games against Philadelphia. Orioles better uh, get the arms back into shape coming up this week. But I'll be back tomorrow to recap game one between Baltimore and Texas. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.